A few months ago on LinkedIn, there was this article about the 18, um, I can't remember what it was entitled now. It was like 18 things that um, show that you have emotional intelligence. And, and for some reason it intrigued me, so I uh, read the article and really found it interesting. And so the guy who wrote it, his name is uh, Dr. Travis Bradbury, and he's a, a, a psychologist. And um, he and another doctor, Gene Greaves, uh, wrote this book called Emotional Intelligence 2.0. And the concept of emotional intelligence has actually been around quite a while. It's been, uh, it was around like 1995 that um, Dr. Daniel Goleman uh, kind of first introduced these concepts. And the thing that was kind of interesting about this is for a long time people have thought that having a high IQ was the big uh, determiner for success. And what they realized was that um, uh, people with just your average IQs outperformed um, those with the highest IQs 70% of the time. And so they were like, okay, so what's this disconnect? You know, what, why are these averagely intelligent people outperforming these, you know, brilliant people? And what they determined was that uh, the critical factor was emotional intelligence. And, and so they kind of defined it as that something that each of us has that is a bit intangible. And it actually affects how we manage behavior, navigate our social complexities, and make uh, personal decisions to achieve positive results. So it's kind of this you know, big idea of how we just interact with other people. And that was, you know, so it's kind of like a big thing about people skills. And so it really intrigued me. Um, if you didn't get a quiz, uh, you're coming in. Yeah, pop quiz. <laughs> you came in, now you're stuck. Um, uh, grab one of these sheets that are in on one of the chairs. Um, and just go ahead and kind of work through that while I'm talking. Uh, so after decades of research, uh, and they realized that 90% of top performers actually have emotional intelligence. So it's something that um, has just really gained a lot of momentum. So while I read Emotional Intelligence 2.0, and most of my stuff is coming from Dr. Bradbury, uh, there are like hundreds of emotional intelligence quizzes and stuff that are online. There's all kinds of them that you can actually pay for. And then they will um, also provide you with um, different skills and strategies to help you improve your emotional intelligence in the areas that you're lacking. So that's why I wanted to bring this quiz to you today was so that you could take the quiz and get an idea of um, one of the areas that you might be more lacking in and then you know spend a little time uh, learning how to improve in that area. Yeah? You have more quizzes. I do not. There's well, there's one up here. One there. We got a couple here and there. <laughs> and and if any of you don't get it, it is um, it's linked on the event board app. So you guys can you know pull it off and, and try it out later. Okay, so let's move on. There are four different components of emotional intelligence. Uh, they are self-awareness, uh, social awareness, self-management, and then relationship management. Are so those in the same order they are in the quiz. Uh, yeah, I think they are actually. Okay. So let's learn a little bit about what each of those actually mean. Self-awareness, -aware first of all, is your ability to accurately perceive your own emotions in the moment and understand your tendencies across situations. Um, one key thing here as you try to develop better self-awareness um, is actually just if you're even aware that you're trying to do better, that's like the first step to just being more aware of your emotions and how they feel um, 
is a pretty big thing. The other thing that's really important with self-awareness, and I found this super interesting, is that um, the most accurate picture of anyone's behavior comes from those around them. People are actually more perceptive of our true behaviors than we ourselves are. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, like, when I was back in grad school and I was still single, and it's when, like, LDS Singles Online first came out and, you know, all the online dating stuff, I can't tell you how many times we would find some guy and he was like, Mr. Cool, the way he presented himself, and then you meet him in real life and you're like, oh, no. <laughs> that, was, that was not exactly how... Um, you presented yourself and so that was probably the first time I ever really thought wow people really view themselves in a lot different light than you know others do um, the next then is the self-management so that's the ability to take uh, the self-awareness um, of your emotions and really stay flexible and and you know keep your behavior moving in a positive direction then social awareness is your ability to accurately pick up on emotions um, in others and understand what is really going on with them. And this one's, um, you know, very interesting because, you know, some people kind of lack those social skills sometimes. They don't understand when, you know, maybe somebody is really sad or grieving and then they just come in and they're like, hey, do you want to go to a movie? And you're like, well, I'm devastated here, you know. So. Uh, those types of cues are very important as well. The well, last one then is relationship management, and that's kind of taking all three of these areas and, and <coughs> using them to um, uh, to manage all of your interactions with others. Okay, so we're going to look at a couple of things. So back to uh, Daniel Goleman. Um, this is what he called his competency framework. And so you can kind of see the major characteristics that come in within each of the four uh, components. So I wanted to just maybe describe a little bit more about um, each of these. So starting first with self-awareness, the big thing here is that you're understanding emotions. Um, or you, know, you, you gain emotional knowledge. So this is your ability to identify and comprehend emotional chains um, or the transition from one emotion to another. Uh, next then is the self-management, which is using those emotions. So that's your ability to access an emotion and, and, and then to reason with it so that you can actually use it to assist you um, in your interactions or, or in your thoughts and your decision making. Then the social awareness is where you're actually identifying emotions. And those are your own emotions and the emotions of others. Um, and then lastly, with managing or relationship management, obviously it's managing those emotions. So it's that ability to self-regulate emotions and then to manage them in other people as well. So um, we want to find out then how emotionally intelligent you are. So you guys have had this little quiz here. What it actually does, it's going to um, kind of give you a score from one to 10 in each of those four quadrants. And um, if you were to get a book such as Emotional Intelligence 2.0, um, it actually goes through and it gives you 66 strategies to help you improve in those four areas. So obviously I don't have time to cover that today. So um, Dr. Bradbury had also written this article where he kind of condensed things down into 18 of those um, hard characteristics of people with a high IQ. So his... Um, so honestly, if, if this turns out to be something that you're, you're really intrigued by or you really want to you know, delve into a little more and, and focus on improving your emotional intelligence in a certain area, um, there's all kinds of stuff available online that's free. There's you know, little books. This book was like $15. And, and it came with um, uh, a free test. Um, and, and normally you have to pay for the test. So. There, you know, there are tons of options out there. This is just your little sampling of emotional intelligence. Okay, so.
So the 18 different um, hallmarks of a high IQ, um, some of the most important ones. First one is uh, you have a robust uh, emotional vocabulary. So this one's kind of tying back into the self-awareness. Uh, basically, people, uh, only about 36% of people are, act, are able to accurately identify their emotions when they are happening. Um, and so it, this one is kind of a, an exercise in understanding how you're feeling and then accurately labeling those feelings so that you can then make a more rational decision in how you're going to act when you're feeling a certain way. Um, so, for example, instead of just saying you're feeling bad today, um, if you have more emotional intelligence, you might uh, describe something as you're feeling irritable or frustrated or downtrodden or you're anxious. You're a lot more specific. So that's like the cool chart you put on your fridge, right? With all the <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah, or you know, I mean, sometimes like Facebook, you can do your status update and then say you're feeling anxious, or <laughs> it's not just usually I'm feeling bad. So I guess Facebook's helping us out there with identifying our emotions. Um, and then you know, the more specific you are, then we have better insight into exactly how we're feeling and what caused it, and then what we can do about it. Okay, so it's just it's. A lot of it is kind of taking a step back from the emotions that we feel and let's process them in a logical manner so we don't make irrational or impulsive choices that can then, you know, uh, be a detriment down the line. Okay, the next one then is oh, you're curious about people and you're open with them. Curiosity helps develop empathy and empathy helps us to better understand one another. So whether you're an introvert or an extrovert doesn't really matter. It's when you show interest in people and you want to learn about them and you ask questions, the more you do that, the better shot you're going to have at actually understanding them, understanding their needs, and not misinterpreting their, their needs or, you know, whatever, them in general. Um, and then in turn, by you being open and sharing you know, information about yourself. This isn't like, you know, you have to be an open book who just spouts off inappropriate information all the time. But, you know, when people are going through a difficult time or something, when you can also empathize or share, you know, some of your own feelings or whatever, that um, also gives less room for people to misinterpret you as well. So once again, that's going to aid in our communication. Next one is you embrace change. This is probably the one of the ones that I thought, though, this one's super good for BYU-Idaho. Because what happens around here? Constant change. Something's always changing. We're continually growing. You know, there's always something going on. So um, by being flexible and adapting, that shows a lot of emotional intel intelligence. Um, uh, people who have a high, oh, I forgot to mention that um, it's, often uh, uh, abbreviated as EQ or EI. So EQ, like an emotional quotient, like IQ is intelligence quotient. Um, so people with a high EQ, uh, they know that fear of change can be very paralyzing. I don't know, if maybe some of you are that way. Um, my husband doesn't do real well with change, and so you know, it does. It kind of paralyzes him sometimes from making really big moves or decisions um, in his life. Um, so, you know, how do you, you know, that can sometimes really keep you from, you know, moving forward with, you know, big things that can really make you happy and successful. So the thing they mention here is to really look for change. Always be aware of things that might be lurking right around the corner. And then, and then always kind of have that plan of action. And honestly, for me, that's, that's a lot of, you know, how I function. I always kind of have this idea of, okay, here's what the worst thing that might happen. And then I kind of formulate this little plan in my head of, okay, how could I deal with that? And for me, that kind of relieves a lot of the stress or the worry about that type of situation. 
Um, next then is to know your strengths and your weaknesses. Uh, so know what you're good at, know what you are terrible at, um, know what things push your buttons, know what environments you know drive you crazy. But on the flip side, know what things or environments just really make you thrive and show your strengths. Um, and then use those to your advantage. Okay? There's nothing that says you have to you know, do things that are going to display your worst characteristics. You know, that's just not an ideal thing. But um, so, you know, really play on your strengths. Now, so what are we going to do about those things that we're not so great at? They call it lean into your discomfort. So obviously, we've got to, we've got to confront the things that we need to improve. Uh, another term he used was discover your own arrogance. Okay, this one I thought was interesting. Your arrogance is the things you don't bother to learn about and you dismiss as unimportant. Okay, so things that, you know, maybe they really are important or maybe in a certain job situation, that needs to be something that you value and think is important. So once you can kind of identify your arrogance and you can see what your weaknesses are, then you're going to have ample opportunity to work on those and to actually improve them. Um, and then basically, if, if you never are able to manage yourself effectively and you continually ignore things that you need to improve, you're never really going to change and improve. So, you know, it's a key concept. Do you take any comments? Yes, go ahead. Peter Drucker makes a big thing out of we need to spend more time focusing on our strengths rather than worrying about our weaknesses. And especially, I think, as a parent, we need to do more of that with our children, especially work on their strengths as opposed to worrying about weaknesses. I mean, weaknesses are perhaps something we're going to have always, mm -hmm. and we're not going to be able to overcome them. Uh, so let's focus on what we do best, whether it's at work or home. I like that idea, definitely. Mm -hmm. We also have to remember though that Christ tells us to come on to him and he will show us our weaknesses that mm -hmm. we strengthen. So I think we need to find Good. Out. There it's a total tightrope walk kind of a balance. Um, I really do like though the uh, helping your children find their strengths and their you know, because um, my parents were really huge on that, helping us find things that we were good at that helped develop self confidence so that you can move in, to, well, so you can get through the teenage years without, you know, being a crumpled mess. And, and then, you know, proceed into adulthood with confidence. All uh, right, next one. Uh, you're a good judge of character. This one really ties into the social awareness. That ability to read people, know what they're about, understand what they're going through. Um, this skill helps make you an exceptional judge of character. And so you kind of, you get people, you understand what they're all about, understand their motivations, and sometimes you might even really understand the things that lie hidden beneath the surface. And I think that one ties in a lot to, you know, really getting to know people. You know, when you know them on a different level and then they react in a certain way, it, it makes a lot more sense. For example, in grad school I had a roommate um, who came from a very broken family. And there were times when she would do stuff that would annoy me. And I'd always been raised with, if somebody does something you don't like, you need to change yourself or remove yourself from the situation because you can't be telling people how to do things, you know, to meet your demands. So I would do that. And she confronted me on this one time. And she just said, when you leave, it hurts me because I think you're going to abandon me because she had been abandoned by her father had left the family, and then her mother had just left. She was there as a person, but she wasn't there for her children. So she had been abandoned. So even someone yelling at her or telling her you're doing this wrong was better than no one being there. So that was a key idea. You know, it's not just about how I deal with things or how I perceive things. It's how we're all interacting and understanding one another. Um, okay, you are difficult to offend. This one's a tough one sometimes, but people who have high e, uh, EQ are have a real firm grasp of who they are. They know, you know, what it's really hard for people to get their goat or you know really offend them. 
They have a very thick skin, self-confident, they're very open-minded, and you know, they can poke fun at themselves and even let others, you know, poke fun at them. Key one, you know how to say no to yourself and to others. This shows a lot of self-control. Um, the difficulty here is that, um, you know, for some of us, we want to always be able to say yes, and I can do that. But by um, when it's time for you to say no, this will help keep your stress within a manageable level. Make sure that when you're saying no, you don't use the wimpy phrases, oh, I don't think I can, or oh, I'm not certain. Just say no. And then realize that by saying no, you're honoring the commitments that you already have, and and then you'll be more capable of completing them successfully. Does that include saying no to your bishop? <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you take that up between the, <laughs> yourself and the Lord. <laughs> uh, next is you can let go of mistakes. So you want to distance yourself from your mistakes, but don't forget them. We don't want to dwell on them constantly because that's going to keep us from really moving forward. But at the same time, we we do want them within a, a reach so that we don't repeat them. Okay, so it's kind of a real tightrope walk, you know, to make sure that you're not dwelling on them, but you at least can remember, oh, okay, that didn't work out so well, so let's not do that again type of a thing. Um, so the idea here is transform your your failures into nuggets of improvement. I just thought that was kind of cool. Nuggets of improvement. Um, or, you know, get right back up every time you fall down. Uh, the last one uh, didn't show. Sorry. It's you give and expect nothing in return. This is um, kind of that concept of when someone gives you something spontaneously and they don't expect anything, it really leaves a powerful impression on you. Um, so, for example, maybe you had a conversation with someone and you were talking about a book and then a couple weeks later they show up with that book in hand and, and you know, give it to you. Hey, I remember that you we talked about this or whatever. Doesn't that make you feel good to know somebody was thinking about you? Debbie, for example, her first semester of TGL, she sent me a little bouquet of cookie flowers, <laughs> cookie bouquet, and it was just so nice. She didn't expect me to give her anything back. Right. <laughs> but, you know, by, by just doing little things like that, it shows that you're thinking about other people. It, I mean, it ties into showing gratitude also, which is another thing we'll talk about in a minute. Okay, a few more things. i got to cruise through here. Don't hold grudges. Okay? Obviously, we know the Lord has told us that we need to forgive, but holding on to a grudge also keeps that stress response, the fight or flight response, active. It's, I'm sure many of us have gone through those times where we're just angry about something and we haven't let go, and then that moment that you truly forgive or you just let go of whatever was whole, you know, upsetting you, you feel that wave of relief and you know, I think part of that is spiritual, and I think another part of it is truly just a physical stress release that you're no longer carrying. Um, let's see. Let's next one. You neutralize toxic people. Um, yesterday in our TGL and AIM um, type discussions, we were talking a lot about some difficult um, conversations and such. And one of the things that kept coming up is. Uh, uh, preparing for these difficult conversations and then really being sure that we keep our feelings and our emotions in check so that we're not fueling that. Does the author of this volume talk about how to neutralize toxic people? Um, he does. He, he, um, well, just a few things he's got here. Uh, approach the situation rationally. Identify your own emotions. Identify their emotions. Uh, don't allow anger and frustration to really fuel that chaos. Um, I appreciated yesterday. Uh, oftentimes, you know, when we get into these difficult situations, sometimes they totally derail, and you've got somebody like yelling at you on the phone, or they're really upset. And they said you can often help bring things back together by using he called it a fix-it statement. Such as, you know, this is hard. I know this is a difficult conversation. 
I know Jane, that was some a tactic that you had used that you know just right from the get go, acknowledging that it was going to be something hard to talk about, um, or asking the other person how they feel. That was another thing James had mentioned in a difficult situation he had. He just asked the people what they were feeling and and how things were going and. He really didn't even have to broach the difficult subject because it came up on its own kind of a thing. So uh, there are lots of you know different ways. I've learned a lot from Heather too in dealing with um, student grievances and such that you know when we write an email, there is no emotion in that email and, and no judgment type things in the things that we say so that obviously in online communication we try to remove as much um, misinterpretive um, phrases as possible and just keep it very benign um, but also yes you say also with online communication it's hard to read the other yes person. yes so you know we have some extra challenges that way mm -hmm. don't don't seek perfection we know humans are fallible um, and if you're constantly trying to be perfect, then you actually will never be truly happy or satisfied. You'll always feel stressed because you didn't do well enough. So, you know, focus on coming back to those uh, strengths. Focus on the things you did well and then do better the next time in a different, uh, you know, way. Next, appreciate what you have and show it. This comes back to my gratitude attitude. but you know, the more grateful we are for things, the more, the better mood that we have. Everybody has trials, everybody has hard things, but I think focusing on what is going well rather than what's not going well really helps keep us in on the right path of, and perspective. Because, you know, you let those negative emotions get in there and, and then we start getting problems with depression and you know, just things that then kind of become this downward spiral. And it's really, you know, there are some things we can try to do to help keep our spirits up and, and keep us happy. And that's one, I've, you know. And then the other thing, uh, like going back to Debbie, showing your thanks when, when you really feel like somebody's done something for you or just, you know, letting them know that you appreciate them. Next is, I think this one's an important concept for us since we work online so much. Disconnect, okay? You need to disconnect. Take some time off the grid. It helps keep your stress under control. You get to actually interact with the people around you, and you'll be living in the moment instead of texting on your phone while your kids are telling you about their day at school. Did you actually hear what they said? No. My, I mean, I, I'm not the best example of this, but you know, I can tell you my son's like, you're not listening to me. <laughs> and I'll try to hurry and remember the last thing you said or something, but but it's, he's right. A lot of times I'm I'm not listening, and you know he also needs to realize if I started texting before he started talking, he should maybe wait till I was done. You know, so there's there's some give and take there. Um, but really, turn off the screen uh, screens, all of the different screens, phones, tablets, TVs, computers, um, and this segues into sleep you need to get enough sleep and you need to get some quality sleep okay sleep is when your brain recharges and and so I'm sure all of you can attest to the fact that when you are tired you lose your self-control I when I'm exhausted do I yell at my kids more yes that's that's a no-brainer um, I it's harder to keep your attention uh, your memory is not as good, you know, it kind of has a big ripple effect. So if you're tired and you know you're tired, is it okay to set up someone? No. Can we handle this in the morning? Oh, can we handle it? Yes. yes. Yeah, can we handle it in the morning? Um, and that's a great one. That's actually one of the, one of his strategies in here is to sleep on it. You know, just take a day or so and don't react, especially when you're heated or when you're feeling exhausted. When I was going to school and the daycare and everything else, Periodically, I'd be annoyed, and my mother would call her. I would call her, and she'd always feel guilty. Wow, sounds like somebody should sit down and read a story with their children. Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 away from what it's uh -huh. Yeah. You know? So you know, with this sleep, 
Uh, that some things to do to improve it very quickly. 20 minutes of morning sunlight before noon helps reset your internal clock. Um, and it needs to be like outdoor. So if any of your outdoor exercises in the morning, you just like kill two birds with one stone and you burned off a bunch of stress, uh, stress, you know, byproducts. Um, just so you know, I have a health background. So I'm always big on exercise, eat right, sleep, that kind of stuff. Um, turn off all of your electronics two hours before bedtime because the light from those um, kind of is mimics sunlight. So it keeps your brain a little bit. Uh, and that can make it difficult to fall asleep. Keep your bed for sleeping. Don't walk, work in your bed or watch TV, uh, that type of stuff. And then lastly, avoid caffeine. Limit your caffeine intake. Um, with the caffeine, it kind of triggers the adrenaline type response with fight or flight. So it kind of puts you in a hyper arousal state. And that, once again, um, lets your emotions overrun your behavior sometimes. You don't think as logically that way. So if you do have caffeine, it has kind of a long half-life. It takes about six hours to work out of your system. So you'd want to avoid it after about noon or so to um, not let it disrupt your sleep. Then we're getting almost to the end. And once again, my slides are too short. Uh, you stop negative self-talk in its tracks. The more negative you are with yourself, the more damaging it is to your self-management. So, you know, try to eliminate those, I always do that, or I'm never, you know, never good enough, or I'm such an idiot. You know, those types of things, stop doing those. Uh, you know, I've often, when I used to teach stress management classes, I would tell my students, talk to yourself like you would your child. Do you go around telling your kids they're idiots? If you do, you need to change that. <laughs> but also, if you're telling yourself you're an idiot all the time, you need to change that as well. Because talk, talk like you would, you know, nurture yourself. Don't berate yourself. Um, and the very last one is you won't let anyone limit your joy. And so that idea is that no matter what other people think about what you've done or what you're doing or how you do things, your self-worth comes from within. And I know that's, you know, definitely something that, you know, our Heavenly Father, you know, really, um, you know, our self-worth, no matter what we do, He will always love us. And His, the amount of love that He has for us will never change based on that. And so, kind of incorporating that love that our Heavenly Father has for us into other things is um, beneficial as well. So, sorry we've run out of time <laughs> for questions or whatnot, but if you ever want to talk a little bit, um, that's something I really enjoyed, and thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.